question uh, is a leakage and the faults, and uh, we have two talks. And our first talk, uh, entitled by the exploring integrity of AEADs with faults, definitions, and constructions, are also the uh, Sayan Deep Sahar, Mustafa Kailala, and Toma Peran. And uh, Mustafa will give us a talk. Please. Thanks. So uh, I will be first discussing a bit about fault attacks, how they work and how we can attack classical AAD schemes. I will give the concept about leveled implementations briefly, and then I will discuss our constructions. So fault attacks have been introduced in 1997, and there is a lot of analysis on and discussions in the literature on how they can be used to break different schemes. But most of these attacks, they target like either key recovery or state recovery with few attacks that target integrity, but most of them target state recovery. And the countermeasures also target that. However, in this line of work, there are recently some works on this. So there was a paper on sponge-like constructions where the amount of information leaked using faults is bounded in the security proof. And then uh, there was a paper by Fischlin and Ganser in CTRSA 2020 where they started discussing the concept of fault resilient authenticated encryption, and they gave one construction. In this work, we discussed some of the definitions for the fault model and the different constructions like BRF and MAC and authenticated encryption. We also show that the construction they gave in the 2020 paper does not achieve integrity with faults. And there is a parallel work, which is the, which is the talk after this one, where they talk about the security of fault resilient MACs. So there are different types of fault attacks. There is something called differential for fault attacks or DFA, where, for example, you encrypt the message and you encrypt the same message again and you inject a fault and then you compare the output difference and you try to analyze it to get information about the state or the key. There is statistical fault attacks or statistical ineffective fault attacks, CIFA, where you have many plain texts and you're injecting faults and then you observe some statistical properties in the output. And then there are like something called safe error attack, which is mostly you inject a fault and you check that the fault did not have an effect on the message. And from that, you can also get yes, information about the state. So classical uh, AAD schemes don't take fault, faults into consideration because they assume the implementation will be protected. So we can, even if we, our goal is not the key recovery, we can find the text to break the integrity of this scheme. So in this slide, we, talk, we see ASCON. And for ASCON, we like a sponge construction. So we're encrypting the plain text and getting the cipher text. So for example, we can inject a fault inside the state, but it doesn't affect the cipher text. And then we can deduce what is the value of this cipher text will be corresponding to that fault. And that helps us break the integrity. We can do the same attack on other types of AD schemes. So for example, on CFP, we can also inject a fault internally in the plain text, but it doesn't affect the cipher text output. And if we have control over this fault, it can help us break the integrity. There are also attacks on SIV and ink the Mac. The SIV one will be discussed later in the talk when we get to the authenticated encryption section. So what is leveled implementation? It's a concept that was introduced in the context of uh, side channel protection and leakage resilient schemes, where they classify the modes into two categories. So on the left, we have the OCB scheme, which uses a secret key everywhere. And if we wanna protect it against leakage, or in this case against fault, we have to protect of everything, like all the, block cipher calls and also all the operations outside the block cipher. While in leveled implementations, we can have security proofs which only assume that certain uh, elements of the scheme are heavily protected. So for example, one block cipher call at the beginning and at the end, and the rest either are not protected or are lightly protected, depending on what security goals you want to achieve. So this will lead to our uh, discussion, how this leveled implementation. So to construct our schemes, first we need to construct a PRF that's resilient against faults. So to think about the fault resilient PRF, we think about what happens when we have a PRF and we inject faults in it. 
So we have a non-faulty execution with M, which I would see. And then we have, let's say, a faulty implementation of the PRF, or we inject a fault in it. We insert the same blank text M. We will get a different ciphertext C. However, due to the details of the implementation and how the fault is injected and how the scheme is implemented, it's possible that this fault allows the adversary to uh, guess the input that's corresponding to C dash. So in this case, he leaks one input. And theoretically, at least, we, this like is un unavoidable because we don't know the details of the implementation. We don't know the details of the fault. So it's possible that the, attack will, the attacker will be able to guess this value. However, we say that, okay, even if this value is unavoidable, can we still get something? Like we say, okay, we will not consider this value as part of the challenge queries. Can we still get some security? So we divide the security game into two, into two phases. First is a training phase where we give access to the real implementation to the adversary. And the adversary can inject faults and learn about the implementation. But the values that he guesses from this phase cannot be used during the challenge phase. So in the attack phase or in the challenge phase, he cannot inject faults anymore. And he will be given access to either a real PRF or the same PRF, but without faults. Sorry, a re that's the real PRF. In the other case, it will be just random outputs. So this is in a bit more detail. There is in the paper, there is like the exact details of the model, but here it's just an overview. So in the real world, we have a, in the first phase faulty implementation. And then in the second phase, we have real implementation with fresh inputs. In the ideal world, we have the faulty implementation, but this Oracle will terminate if the PRF implementation leaks more than one point. So if the adversary leaks more than one M dash corresponding to C dash, then the, this will terminate. And in the second phase, it will be just a random input, a random function, and the inputs cannot be repeated. So to implement the faulty Oracle, we assume that we have a, the faulty BRF, the implementation description, and we have a fault specification based on the implementation details and the computing platform. We can specify the fault model. Also more details about this is in the paper. And then it will return either like C dash and if possible, will return M dash. And in the ideal world, it will terminate if the M dash is more than one value. So we can build this construction using like a protected to equal block cipher against fault attacks. And while it's not exactly key recovery, in practice, it should be close to key recovery. Like if you protect your scheme against key recovery uh, against faults, then it should satisfy this. We also think it might be possible to show that the ISAP finalization is also an FRPRF. And see, we don't know how, like if, the, if leaking this M dash is easy or not in practice, but we, we consider it unavoidable theoretically because we don't know all the implementation details. So once we have constructed this FRPRF, we have the FRMAC construction, which is essentially the same security, but for arbitrary lens message, messages. And in this case, we have a hash function and we have a, the BRF that we constructed before. But we also have a random salt, and this random salt is critical for the fault attack also. So we add, we bet the random salt, and we give it to the hash function, and we output here, and the decrypt the verification is simple. We just do this and compare the tag at the end. And the security is the same as the FRPRF, but including the uh, verification. And we assume that there is no collision, so the no collision on the random salt or on the output of the hash. So these two uh, values, if there is a collision on them, that will be included in the bound. And also that in the training phase, only trivial pre-images. So trivial pre-images is like if the hash function is implemented and let's say it's like a round based function. So like it's a SPN or something. And then you inject a fault in the first round, you will be able to, to say this fault corresponding to a certain plain text and this is what we consider trivial. But from the model, we say that you can only get one pre-image per faulty query. You cannot get more than that. 
So now how to use this inside an AED. So first, the AED game is the fault resilient AED game is similar to the PRF. But again, we have like the privacy and the decryption into account. And this game is a variation of already the game that was proposed in the by Fishlin and Gunther in 2022 in CTRC. So they proposed a scheme called SIV random, which is similar to SIV. So you generate two keys and then you take the message with a random salt, do a PRF. So this looks similar to our FR Mac. And then you do a NCBA encryption, but you also encrypt the random salt. And during decryption, it's just the opposite and you check the IV at the end, whether it's equal or not. And in the paper, they claim that this would achieve fault resilient AED. However, we can do an attack on SIV-like schemes, especially if the schemes are not secure against CCA attacks. So basically, we take, so this is an example of a SIV-like scheme where the encryption is stream cipher based or key stream based. So we take the MAC at the beginning, but during the MAC operation, we can inject a fault. So we convert M to M dash, but this will not affect the message when we encrypt it. So we will get a message encrypted with an IV that's corresponding to M dash, but it encrypts M. But because the encryption is linear, we can change the message to be an encryption of M dash. And when we try to verify that, it will pass the verification and it will not be detected as a, in the game as a trivial ciphertext because when, the, when we check here, it was never outputted by the encryption oracle, either in a faulty query or a non-faulty query. So the solution to this is we start from their construction and say, okay, we can do Mac then encrypt like they do, but then we do another Mac at the end. So this is the full construction. And so we have one Mac here and then the encryption and then another Mac at the end, which takes into account the first IV or first tag and the cipher text. And we chose these primitives because also they have nice leakage resilient properties, so we expect them also to be secure against side channel. However, for the combined security where you have fault and leakage at the same time, that's we haven't studied yet. So for the security arguments for this scheme, we assume that we have no collision on the randomness, the random salt, and we have no collision on the output of the first smack. Again, if these collisions exist, they are captured in the pound in the paper. And if that happens, then the security reduces to the fault resilience of these three layers. So first I will sum up, like it's, we say we, in the paper, we conclude that it's possible to protect against certain classes of fault attacks using these leveled implementations but also that random salt is critical for differential faults. We cannot protect against it. And I think uh, in the next paper, they also use random salt in one, of the, in one of their constructions. And it's also possible to prevent single differential fault attacks with less cost than dummy duplication. Dummy duplication means you have two AE schemes, two black box AE schemes or the same a AE scheme twice and you're just implementing it twice and comparing the results. Here we only have one kind of one AE scheme plus one MAC. So what's the state so far? So we have uh, an open problem that we assume certain properties about the hash function. So verification of these properties, even though like it sounds easy, but we it's not in this paper yet. Uh, we also want to show that security against combined attacks when we have both fault and leakage at the same time and uh, protecting against, against multiple faults. I should say here multiple differential faults because uh, the BRF or the encryption, they currently they can protect against many faults, but for these integrity attacks where we decouple uh, the Mac from the encryption, this scheme will protect against one fault because it has a redundancy of one, but if we wanna protect against more faults, we'd have to have more redundancy. And as I said, there was this parallel work that did work only on Max, and they have schemes to protect against more than one fault, but to protect against two faults, they have two Mac invocations. 
So is there a possibility to do it cheaper than that? Maybe, maybe not. And the last thing we, we are looking at as a future work is looking at certain fault countermeasures and how they relate to our assumption. So the most obvious one would be ICAP's PRF. Does it satisfy this assumption or not? Something we're looking at. Thanks. Thank you. So move to that question. Uh, is there any question from Beijing? I think, or any other question from Kobe? Hello. So thanks for your presentation. Um, I had one small question, or well, two actually. So you had the learning phase and the challenge phase. Mm -hmm. They can be interleaved, right? Or is it really like sequential? Uh, so far, for these schemes, they cannot be interleaved, I think. So you first have a learning phase and then the challenge phase. Okay. Does it make sense or is it possible to... to... I think it makes sense in certain applications where you have the adversary has the device and can inject faults. But you, you're concerned about the security after that? Yes, of course. Yes, yes. Um, so ISAP's PRF, this is... Yeah, the, the rekeying function in the ISAP. The rekey... Ah, okay. So the rekeying function yeah, yeah. in the suffix goods. Yeah, ah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yes, yeah. yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, I have no other questions. Okay. Are there any other questions? I have one small question also. So you, in your MEM constructions, yeah, it seems that now you have, you, the other, uh, yeah, okay, that's right. So you have uh, T0 here is a code with a random. Uh, yeah. uh, I, I don't see what the intention here. Yeah. So Could you explain something? So the intention is need to hide R. Yeah. Because if, if R is controlled during the encryption, during the decryption, it could lead to problems. So in the Mac, there is an assumption that R is communic communicated securely. Communicated securely means yeah. that it is not uh, trans transferred in clear. Not, yeah, yeah. It's it's communicated something out of band, That's right? In the Mac. Ah. Uh, here we do it through the encryption. Yes. So R is not are uh, present in Korea, it's so always encrypted. Yeah. But how do you compute H1? Sorry, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah. R is a, yeah. So the output is, so so the, uh, the text size now is like three N, where N is the ciphertext block size. Yeah. So the text size will be T1, C0, sorry, the tag will be T1, C0, T2. So you will start the decryption from T like this, you verify T2, and then you decrypt this, and you get R, and then you do the last map. Uh, all right. Ah, uh, yeah, I see. Ah, uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. And so sorry. And I'm, I'm, yeah. The are really small question. <laughs> you yeah. know, what the, have you considered the possibility of inserting the port into the random generator itself? Like in the protected element. R. I mean R. Uh, a differential fault, yes. So that's yes. why R has that, to be secret. Okay, thank you. Because differential fault, if it's secret, will still be random. Yeah, thank you. So, in other questions from Beijing or Kobe or online? Okay, if not, let's thank speaker again. So the next talk, uh, entitled as a secure message authentication in the presence of leakage and the faults, uh, authored by Francesco Berti, Chunguro, Thomas Peters, Yao Bin Shen, and Francis Xavier Standard. And the speaker is Yao Bin Shen.
So, Yabin, could would you start? And you are ready? Uh, yes. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we see the screen. Okay. Thanks for the introduction. Um, today I'm going to talk about uh, secure mystery authentication in the presence of both leakage and both. And this is the joint voice Francisco Chun, Thomas, and Francois Xavier. Uh, so the talk will be uh, conceived of three parts. The first will be the motivation, then the contribution. I finally, I will conclude our, our talk. Uh, so message authentication call is a symmetric primitive to ensure the data integrity. Uh, the sender uh, will uh, authenticate the message by using a tag generation algorithm, and, and then send the message and tag to the uh, receiver. Receiver can verify the message by using the verification algorithm, and you output whether you will uh, accept this message or not. And typically, the message authentic calls are designed in a black box way. Uh, that means the attacker only knows the algorithm and can only see the inputs and output, while the key and the internal values are secret. Uh, by in so in practical, uh, in physical implementation, the adversary usually can learn more information uh, by using a side channel attack like the tie or the power consumption to obtain the, maybe the some information on the key. Also, the same information of the internal values. Uh, even, more, even worse, the adversary can be active. He can inject force, and maybe by using the laser of the or the electron magnetic blast. So the the value of key may be inference, and the in, the internal value may be inference. And the adversary can also uh mount the combined attack, like by using a side channel and for the attack. So in this case, it means the key and the interval value can, can be both uh, inference and leak it. So how to protect uh, how to protect the security of map uh, against leakage and force? I will give a example. Uh, hash them PF is a very popular way to design a map. So uh, it consists of part. The first part is the hash function. You will hash the message to a fixed length string. Then use a PRF to encrypt this string to produce the tag. So usually the protection against the side channel attack and force will be using maybe masking or redundancy computation. So in this case, you will introduce a very significant performance of overheads. So how to improve the performance? Uh, a clever idea is to use the uh, level implementation. You can avoid equally protecting all parts or implementation, but we need to identify the protecting protection level of each part. So then we can obtain the performance gains in the physical implementation. Uh, a, typ a typical example is the LOR Mark 1. It's proposed in the Asian Crypt 2021. Uh, so this picture is uh, the scheme. So the, uh, given the message, you use the hash function and then use the TBC to encrypt the hash value and uh, produce the tag. So ratio, indeed, we do not need any protection regarding the hash function and we only need to uh, uh, DPA protected TBC. That's the last call of the scheme. And it can lead to the substantial uh, substantial performance, but uh, their skin only consider the leakage. So can we use the similar idea for the combined attack to include the for the attack? So in this uh, paper, we initial a more level study of marks against the side channel and for the attack uh, in the level implementation. Uh, so now I will uh, give an overview of our contribution. So we first propose a model to capture both the leakage and force. Uh, we also make some assumption that some atomic components that are out of control adversary. Uh, this assumption is naturally because if adversary can uh, obtain any information or, or can influence any internal value, then there's no security at all. Then by using this model, we show that the LOR Mark 1 is insecure if only the verification is faulted. Uh, we also propose two uh, new uh, Mark algorithm. The first, the first algorithm is called LOR Mark D. Is uh is similar to the by iterating the LR mark one twice, but it can reduce uh, more than one fourth, and it's secure for both the uh for resilience and leakage resilience, and in both the verification and generation. We also propose uh, another algorithm called LR mark R that is used the uh, additional redundancy. It can also uh reduce the fourth in both the verification and also the mark generation. 
So let's go into detail how we model the force. So given the cryptography algorithm, y equals to uh, L algorithm kx with implementation uh, from F1 to FM. So usually a uh, cryptography algorithm usually consists of several small function. So the, the left part can be seen at the implementation of this algorithm and we can transform to a dependency matrix. So the left part is the uh, M uh, function and the right part is the dependency matrix. So the first row uh, is the, the first row of the dependency matrix is the input of the first function. And uh, similarly, the second row of the matrix is the input of the second function. And we can look at the, and here the if from the represent uh, means there's no input at this item. We can see example, uh, the small example. So for a cryptocurrency algorithm, uh, consists of implementation F1, F2, F3, and with input X1, X2. Here, the dependency matrix is uh, the, the right path. So the first rule is only X1. So it means only the first function only takes the X1 as input. And the second, second rule is only just the X2. So it means F2, we only take X2 as input. And uh, the third row is the x1, y1, y3. So the third function will text the x1, y1, y2, x input. And here the y1 is the output of the first function and y2 will be the output of the second function. So by using the dependence matrix, we can capture the uh, internal computation of uh, algorithms. So then how to capture the fault, let it inject it uh, into the algorithm. So the left part is the dependency matrix uh, in the previous example. If the adversary injects force, uh, then we can capture by using the right part, the 40 matrix. So the right part matrix here, the X1 prime, it means the X1 is 40 to be the X1 prime. And in the last row, here is the new uh, value Y1 prime. It means the Y1 is 40 to be the Y1 prime. And also the second rule, the X2, we use the dot in this position means uh, there's no fault in this value. Uh, and also the, the third rule, the first element in the third rule, we also use the dot to mean uh, this value is no fault. And we also use another symbol in the third rule is the above symbol to mean uh, uh, this value should be protected against force. Uh, so in this paper, uh, in this paper, we consider two forks. Uh, the first one is stuck at force. It means the adversary can replace the base of the interim value by any value uh, she chosen. We also consider the differential force. That means the adversary can XOR the differential to the internal value. So at this stage, we we already capture the force and how to modeling leak leakage. Similarly, for cryptography algorithm uh, with the implementation from uh, F1 to FM, we associate a leakage function LOI for each uh, function. So uh, the leakage function will be a vector from L1 to LOM. And we write uh, LO algorithm KX for a leaky algorithm, which is almost equivalent to the original algorithm plus the output of the leakage. Uh, so naturally, we can define the 40 DQ algorithm uh, as the LO algorithm KXZ. And here, J will be the, the four they injected to release uh, algorithm. So here is a sim uh, example. So if the 40 tuple is, if the 40 matrix is uh, in the right part, uh, as the same in previous example, so adversary has injected the fourth X1 prime and also the Y1 prime. So we can use this vector Z to capture this 40 tuple. So then the uh, 40 leakage algorithm will, the Z here is just the X1 prime and the Y1 prime. Uh, we also uh, make some assumption in our paper. Uh, we assume the key is fourth immune. It means we do not consider really the key attack in our, in our model. We also assume that the, the function fi is regarded as an atomic component. So we do not consider the fault inside the, the, this small function. We also consider the fault length model. 
uh, we also dis, uh, consider the unbounded force and aerobounded force. The unbounded force means that the velocity can inject any number of force in this algorithm. The aerobounded force means that the velocity can inject uh, at most allo force in these algorithms. So at this point, we capture both the force and leakage by using our matrix. So then let's see uh, the LOR Mark 1. Uh, so this, uh, this picture of LOR Mark 1, this I introduced in the previous slide. So we show that the advantage for the, uh, against the stack at and differential for the leak attack uh, in verification uh, can be captured by this uh, equation. It means that uh, if adversary want to find a very different jury, then the adversary needs to either to find the collision against the hash function or find a very table against the strong and predictable uh, with leakage security or TBC F. Here we do not make an ideal assumption on TBC. We only assume that it is a uh, strong and predictable in the leakage uh, setting. And this can be evaluated by the, uh, by the lab. Uh, so we uh, this is uh, to show how to model, how to use our model uh, for the LOR Mark 1. So here the atomic implicit, uh, so for the verification LOR Mark 1, it consists of uh, a hash function and so also inverse of TBC. So the atomic implementation here will be the F1, will be just the hash function. The F2 will be the inverse of TBC. And so for the input X1, X2, which will be the, the, the matrix and also the tag, the output of the first function will be y1, which is exactly the hash value, and the, the output of the second function will be the inverse of TBC. Uh, so the dependency matrix can be captured by the left part, and also the faulty matrix can be captured by the right part. Uh, this faulty matrix means the adversary can inject any fault uh, in the x1, x2, or y1 in these three positions. So a faulty liquid verification query can be captured by the symbol at FLO verification K and TAC Z1, Z2, Z3. And uh, also we, the leaky TAC generation query can be captured by the LOR Mark K. Uh, so um, as mentioned previously, the LOR Mark 1 can only re register for, uh, for the TAC verification. Here we show an attack well, the adversary can inject fault uh, during the attack generation. So he can only focus on the hash value. The attack procedure is uh, as follow. The adversary can simply just compute the hash value of the matrix M broccoli and also another hash value of M prime, and then compute the difference of these two hash values. And then he can query M to this uh, mark and inject the differential for delta into H to a, a obtain the corresponding tag, then the M prime and the tag will be a very forgery because M prime never query to this algorithm. So to improve the security, uh, we, we propose another algorithm called LOR MACD, which can do GS fault in both the tag generation, also tag verification. It's similar like the iterating the LOR Mark one twice. And here I want to emphasize the, intern the internal value in the picture W, which will be used as the key of the second TBC should be protected against the, the force. Uh, and we show that the forge advantage for the stack add and differential and one bounded for the leak attack in touch ratio and verification uh, can be reduced to the collision resistance of the hash function and also the uh, a new definition that is called set preserving unpredictable TBC. So, and here uh, there's a tag called the grafting attack that can work on any iterative construction. Uh, so for any attack, the iterative scheme that consists of two parts, maybe uh, F and H, uh, so for a grafting attack, it, the adversary can force query a uh, message M1 to skin X and inject 40 value uh, at its start to replace the, the correct value uh, H1 and then query the second message M2 to the S and inject 40 value H1 to replace the uh, H2 and then obtain the second tag. 
then you can use the force mystery and the second tab to forge uh, avoid the forgery and the success, successful probability will be one. So this attack means the protection of the W in the LRMD is necessary. Otherwise the adversary can break the skin. So if we by iterating, maybe iterating many times, then the LRMD can reduce more force. And finally, we also propose another algorithm called the LOR mark, mark R is use uh, additional redundancy. So it's similar to LOR mark one, instead we use the redundancy R, uh, they will be taken as input uh, for a hash function and, and also as input to the uh, final TBC. So here the, the redundancy R is something like the commitment of the uh, hash value. And for each tax generation, this data should be selected. Uh, we also show the forge advantage of this skin can be reduced to either the collision resistant and pre resistant resistance after computation of the hash function. And also the strong and predictable with the security of the TBC or the data of the R. So here is the conclusion. So we propose a model to capture both the leakage and force. And we also show the previous LRMAC1 is secure uh, only if the touch verification is faulted. We also propose two marks, they call LRMACD and LRMA. They can reduce fault by using different mechanisms. Uh, there are also more in paper, uh, including the discussion of full resilience and full resistance and also the discussion of sub-automatic force and also our model discussion and the proof details. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So, any questions uh, also from Beijing? No questions or uh, then any questions from Kobe? Hello, uh, thank you for your presentation. And um, one small question I have is you lo looked only at two types of uh, faults, like the fault at and the, the, uh, um, the stuck at and the, the difference. Um, is there a possibility to generalize to yeah, not any possible fault, obviously, but uh, but to a wider class of faults, maybe I missed it. Yeah, I think it is possible to generalize because that because there are many type of faults, and to make the proof and also the construction simple, we only focus on the two popular faults: there is uh, stack at and differential fault. So I think it, it is possible to generalize the model and consider more different type of faults. Okay, but the bound would become much worse then, or what do you expect? Yeah, maybe, but for the stack at four, I think it's also quite strong in the in the physical implementation. So it depends on how strong the adversary will be. Yes, you mean it is maybe not even meaningful to generalize. Yeah, I think the stack at and difference four already very strong because typical, yes. typically the for the tech is is hard to to mount in a pretty. Yes. Stack. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, so I have one question. So uh, about your LR mark D, I mean that the D should be the double. <laughs> yes. And uh, yeah. Yeah, my uh, my question is that uh, if the, we don't have to consider the leakage, I mean the, the, only the fault attack is possible. Then the uh, can we use the, just a naive black box secure max uh, twice? Is that enough or not? <laughs> uh, you mean implement a, a different max twice? 
Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. To my uh, understanding, yeah, to my naive understanding, that uh, duplication is the best, most basic uh, protection against fault attack. So, yeah, I think uh, it's, I think it's be possible, and I, I think the implement the two different algorithms twice is a good way for the for against the for the attack. But here, I think our construction may be a, a bit efficient because we only use a single key care. K here, and we derive a second key by using the first construction. So, and our construction have the almost the same component. They only only based on the TBC and the, also hash function. So maybe a bit efficient, more efficient than a simply implement the mark every twice. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you. Okay, if no more questions. Let's thanks uh, the speakers or the speakers of the session that the questions. Yeah.